We are continuing in our sermon series this week on the book of Ephesians, and we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verse, uh, starting in verse 17 this morning. Um, I'm going to give you a quick recap of where we're at before we dive back into this. As I've, uh, kind of as we've got into chapter 4 of this, I kind of keep saying the same thing to kind of recall what we're talking about. Paul calls us to find our identity in Christ and our relationship with God through Jesus. And in the first half of the book, remember there's only one command, and that is to remember. To remember who we were before Jesus so we don't forget that we are now something very different in Jesus. And it's the second half of the book, in starting in chapter 4, that he says, since this is who you are, Let's talk about how we ought to live. And we're going to continue with that today. Um, And and really, the the whole second half of the book is a series of of commands, a series of instructions for the church on how to live out this identity in Christ. And today we're going to focus on the idea of putting, laying aside our old life and picking up this new life that we have in Jesus. So let's pray and dive into God's word for us today. Lord Jesus, we need your spirit here this morning. We need you to speak your word of, uh, words of truth to us, Lord God. We need you present to transform who we are from who we used to be to who we are in you. Speak your truth today, Lord. Meet us where we're at. Transform us and change us into the new creations we are called to be. And help us to live out that life. In Jesus' name. So Paul, Paul, and, and, and by the way, I'm intentionally breaking this up into smaller chunks because there is so much in in this book. There's so much in these commands and these statements and these instructions. And I don't, when you go to school to be a pastor, to like learn how to preach, there's kind of what they call a rule of three. And the rule of three is people can only typically remember about three major things. And after that, they're going to forget anything else you say, which I don't know if that's actually true or not. Um, But you'll often see sermons, they'll be like, that's a good three point sermon. There's a reason for that. And sometimes the only way to make sure that we, we retain and remember and can really engage in something is to take smaller bites. And so that's why we're doing this. We're only going to go through like about six or seven verses, eight verses at a time here. Um, and I'm trying to do it in, in, in logical chunks where kind of there's a break in in logic, but you'll see like even next week, Paul picks up obviously immediately where he leaves off here. Um, So just keep that in mind. If you're like, it's kind of arbitrary. Why are you starting, you know, stopping at this spot? Obviously the next verse goes with this. We got to stop somewhere. So there's, so there's some, there are some logical breaks here, but so Paul, uh, Paul continues from where he left off before saying, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Okay, so... One of the things that, is, that can seem very jarring and can easily be misunderstood if you just started reading this, this if I just said, hey, we're going we're gonna to go through Ephesians, let's start in 4.17. You would probably get the understanding that Paul's like, I hate Gentiles. These people are horrible. Okay, I'm going to remind you, Paul is speaking primarily to Gentiles when he says this. He goes, stop acting like Gentiles. And you might be like, what now? Like, you're talking to Gentiles. Why are you saying this? And and what he's saying here is 
his ab- admonition is to walk or live differently than we used to. He's saying, don't act like you used to. Yes, I know I'm speaking to people that are Gentiles that have, that have lived the majority of their life ignorant of God. You're not anymore, so don't act like you are. You can't do that anymore. The, the call to not walk like the Gentiles is a reference to those who do not know Christ. He's, saying, he's not saying, hey, listen, if you're a Gentile, whether you know Jesus or not, you know, you're living pretty poorly. Now he's saying, he's using the term Gentile here to say those who are apart from Christ, not only historically, but currently. So again, just to remind you, historically, God called the Jewish nation, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and set up for himself a, a, a nation of people to follow him. Not all of them did, but he said, you're my people, here's how you ought to live. And you're, as part of that job, you're supposed to call the rest of the world to also come and follow me and be part of, of my people. They fail miserably at that because they could not do that in their own strength, and they weren't intended to. And then Jesus comes along as part of that group, as a Jew, comes along as a perfect person and fulfills every command and then creates in himself a new people composed of both Jews and those who are not Jews. So historically, some of the things that Paul is going to say, like they're, they're separated from God, they're ignorant. If you're a Jewish, you couldn't be ignorant of God and, and, and grow up in, in Israel. You couldn't be. Why? Because it was like intrinsically part of your culture. You couldn't be ignorant. You could choose to be apathetic, but that's different. You couldn't be ignorant of God. You could have a lot of misunderstandings about God, and they did, but like you, they had the law. They had God's word. They had the Old Testament. Gentiles didn't have that stuff. And so, in a sense, Gentiles had the excuse when they acted sinfully, they're like, I don't know, we're just doing what we do. Where when Jews did it, they're like, we have no excuse. We know we're not supposed to live this way. And there is what Paul is getting at. If you are in Christ, you can no longer feign ignorance and say, I don't know what right and wrong is. I just do what I do. You know now. And now you have to live that out. Be- not because you do it to please God, but because if you're in Christ, you should look like Jesus. And so the call to not walk like Gentiles is a reference to not walk like those who do not know Christ. Like I said, remember that he's speaking to both Jews and Gentile converts, though overwhelmingly it's Gentiles. The old life that he says that we have to turn away from, he defines in a couple of ways. One of the first things he says is defined by, a, by feudal minds. What does that mean? Well, feudal means devoid of truth or perverse. He's saying that, and, 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 and just to get this Jew and Gentile thing out of the way, because those are terms that we don't really probably engage with as much, I want you to think about it this way. Gentile, just, just think of Gentile as those who don't know Jesus. Okay? In the world today, in, in the culture that we live in, those who don't know Jesus, are they devoid of tr- truth? Yes. Are they maybe perverse in the way that they think? At times, yes, absolutely. Does that mean they're horrible, evil people? No, it means they're people. Everyone apart from Christ is like that. And if you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I want you to think about this for a second. Were you ever apart from Christ? Was there ever a time in your life that you can think back and say, I remember when I didn't know Jesus? And I know the answer for some of you is, no, I do not remember that time. I grew up in a Christian home. I came to know Jesus very young, and I don't really remember any time that I didn't know Jesus. Good for you. And if you say, well, isn't that the majority of Christians? It shouldn't be. 
That should not be the majority of Christians. The majority of Christians should be people, there should be, that should be, you might say, what, you don't think that people should grow up in Christian homes? Absolutely they should. But there should always be such a growth of people that don't know Christ, who have come to know Christ, that that should always be the majority. Why? Because the world is not overwhelmingly Christian. Now, I'm going to say something a little controversial here, but that is true and has always been true of our country. If you say, well, our country used to be overwhelmingly Christian, it has never been overwhelmingly Christian. It's been overwhelmingly Judeo-Christian in its values, but if you go to 1950s America and you ask people, are you a Christian? Yes, the majority of people would say yes. But were the majority of people following Jesus and had a personal relationship with him? No, they were not. Were they church-going? Maybe. That has nothing to do with it. There is a difference between saying, I'm Christian because I'm, that's the default, and saying, I'm Christian because I have a, a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And there is a huge distinction. Paul, it, when you talk about those who like, yeah, but I went to church my whole life, that's this category of Jews that say, I'm not ignorant, but I'm apathetic. And he's like, man, he's got other words for those, that group, that are not kind. It's that group that Jesus had the most harsh things to say to. But often I feel like Christians look down upon people who aren't Christian, like, oh, man, look at how perverse they are. Of course they are. They don't know Jesus. How else will they act? They don't know truth. And to look down on those who don't know truth is arrogance on our part. And I can say that because I remember when I didn't know Christ. I remember when I came to know Jesus. And I remember the slow transformation that is continuing in my life to this day of this change from perversion to holiness. When Paul is speaking of, of Gentiles and saying, you can't live this way, he's saying it because his assumption is, you all used to live this way. And if you say, I've never lived that way, I've never struggled, I have always been, and he'd be like, listen, you're self-righteous. We all struggle with that. You might say, I know the truth. Then the question is, are you walking in it? And that is actually where he's coming from here. For every single person in the world, there is an old life and a new life. Everyone. And if you say, I grew up in the church. I was a Christian since I can remember. Great, Nicodemus. I, Jesus has some words for you. Now you might say, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm writing a paper right now on John chapter 3. And John inter uh, Jesus interacts with a guy named Nicodemus there. You guys know this story? It's where Jesus says, you must be born again. And he says, I have no idea what you're talking about. Jesus says, you're a teacher of Israel. You are steeped in scripture. You have been exposed to this since you, probably birth. And you don't understand the need for repentance? How can you call yourself a teacher of Israel? The issue that Jesus had with people like Nicodemus and the Pharisees and other religious leaders were that they didn't think that all of this repentance talk applied to them. They thought, we're good. It's those people that are the problem. And instead of having a missions mentality towards those people, they said, we've got it, and sorry, you're going to hell. And that's it. And that is not what Paul is saying at all. He's saying, listen, now that we understand who we are in Christ, let's live that way. Not live as if we're ignorant of the truth. Not live with these feudal minds that are devoid of truth and perverse. Let's not live that way because that's not who we are anymore. It is not a put down of people that are in that position. It is a call to live differently because you are now something different. Our actions are to be based in our understanding of the truth. And if we have come to know Jesus 
everything about what is true and how we see the world changes. And if, and by the way, I, I'll, I'll just say this, this is just personal experience. For me, that change was not overnight. That was an ongoing and still an ongoing thing where there are times, even now, things that I, I learned even in Christian circles that sometimes I'm reading scripture or I'm praying or like I, God, like, you know, I'm listening to somebody else preach or something. And somebody will say something. And I'm like, what now? And I look in scripture. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't think I understood that. I think I've had a misunderstanding of that truth. And when our understanding changes, it changes our actions. And we get that backwards all the time. We want people's actions to change without their understanding changing. We want them to act differently and not want them to actually think differently. Just pre I don't care how you think about this, just act this way. It doesn't work that way. That is not authentic. Thus, before Christ, we were darkened in our understanding. There's things that, that we thought we understood about ourselves and the world that were wrong. And I, I'm going to just say again, I, I don't want to paint this as a picture of like, but if you said a prayer, now you know Jesus, all this changes instantly. It doesn't. It takes time. Because those areas of darkness in our understanding, think about it this way. Think about your mind. Think about your brain the way that it actually is, okay? Um, how much light is shed on your brain at any given moment? It's a pretty easy answer. I don't have any hair, so you'd think more gets to mine, right? Yeah, that's, that, that's, why, that's why God blesses some of us with a little... No, no. Um, we have a skull and skin and all this protective stuff. There is zero light that penetrates our brain at any given moment or, you know, pert near. Right? If, if light's on our brain, something's wrong. <laughs> There's something not going on. But imagine for a moment, our brain is, has no light in it, right? It's dark. And then we come to know Jesus. And imagine Jesus is like, here's the thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just set up shop in your brain. We always talk about your heart. Let's talk about your brain for a second. In your brain, right in the middle. And he lights it up. It's not like every corner is lit. Because there's parts of our thinking and our understanding that we don't want to have changed. Because then we have to change our actions, and we might not want to do that. There are some things that we just don't know, that we're actually still ignorant of. And, and, until we understand, all the, until every part of our, our mind is really illuminated, yeah, there's gonna, this process is going to continue to happen for us. But before we knew Christ, all of our understanding was dark. We were ignorant of God. Now, people that don't know Jesus, you might say, well, if they don't know Jesus, they still might know that there's a God. Yes, 60% of Americans will claim that there is a God. Okay? Actually, that, that statistic's a little deceiving. 60% of Americans claim that it is possible to know that there, is, that there is a God that can be known. That's actually what they state, which you might say, what's the difference? Um, the majority of that 40%, we would say, oh, they're all atheists, they don't believe in a God. Actually, the majority of people that are not, uh, that don't believe in some God are actually agnostic. You guys know the difference between those things? Agnostic means, I don't know if there's a God, and I don't know that we could know if there is a God. That's what agnostic means. It's not saying there is no God, they're just saying, I don't know that, I, I don't know if there is, and I don't know if that's a knowable thing. Okay. That's still ignorance, right? Now, there are other people that, that practice other religions that would say, we'd say, well, they're not ignorant of God. We would say, they don't know the true God. And so they're ignorant of God. When Paul said Gentiles to the, the church in Ephesus, it wasn't like none of them had any kind of religious background. The largest temple in the whole wide world was in Ephesus. The temple to Artemis of Ephesus was in Ephesus. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was literally right down the road from where they were reading this, this letter. They had gods. But when he says you're ignorant of God, he's talking about the God of the Bible, the one true God, the creator of all things, not other religious 
beliefs. And he says, because you're, we are ignorant of God, we were alienated from real life. It's not that we weren't breathing, but we didn't have access to the source of real life, which is God himself. And he said, we're hard-hearted. And I, I'm saying this intentionally. You'll notice, Paul doesn't say, before Jesus, we were these things. He says, don't be like the Gentiles who are these things. I'm trying to really call to our attention the fact that we need to understand this is who we are apart from Christ. And if there are people that we know that don't know Christ, rather than looking down on them, realize all of these things, you might say, yeah, but this is just a choice they're making. Yeah, it might be. Same choice that I made before I didn't know Jesus. Sometimes it's not a choice they're making because if you're ignorant of something, sometimes you don't know that you're ignorant of it. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know, right? Which is why the call to the church is make Christ known. Show Jesus the world, which is exactly what Paul's getting at. He goes, this is who we used to be. We were hard-hearted. That means when we saw God moving, we didn't want anything to do with that. I think I've shared this story before, but I'm going to share it briefly now. I, I get emotional when I preach. I get choked up. That was not always the case. Um, I grew up in an, an environment where you did not talk about your feelings. You kept your emotions right, right down here somewhere. You just keep... I'm, I'm, I'm Scandinavian and German. I got all that ancestry where you're like, you feel it, you swallow that, and you push it down hard. I grew up in a family where words like, I love you and I'm proud of you were not spoken out loud. You don't need to, you don't need to hear that. You just know it. And when I became a Christian, you would think, well, all of that will change. And it should have. But it took a while and it didn't at first. And one Sunday in the fall of, I don't remember what year, but early 2000s, I've been a Christian for a while. I, was in, I think I was either in seminary or, or somewhere in that realm. I came home from church I was uh, a part of. And the sermon that morning had been on apathy. I don't remember the text. I don't remember anything. I just remember the pastor talking about apathy is a cancer to a Christian, to anybody, really. Apathy is not caring. And I remember driving home and being like, okay, whatever, not really thinking about what was said. It was just kind of, I wanted to get home because I really wanted to root for the Vikings because, you know, I hadn't had enough heartbreak that day. So I drove home, and I got home, and I was watching the Vikings game, and it was like halftime. And you know in halftime when there's all these commercials and you're just like, all right, already. So I flipped the channel over, and I'm watching like something, Discovery Channel thing or something like that, and they have a commercial on that, and it was for kids starving in Africa. You give a couple dollars a day to help kids stop starving in Africa. And I said, all right, enough of that click, and God just hit me like a lightning bolt and said, you care more about a bunch of guys on a football field than you care about those kids. This is what you heard about this morning. And I broke down with sobbing. And I asked God to do something that you should never ask him to do, which, as I said, changed my heart. I don't want to be like this. And then guess what happened? You know the story of the little Dutch boy and he keeps the finger in the dike and then he's like, I got to do this, otherwise it's all going to just come out. God was like, take the finger out of the dike. And I'm like, but don't you understand? He's like, just do it. And then it was, and this is it. This is, you wonder why I get choked up, why I get emotional when I talk about God. Because I was hard-hearted. I was very hard-hearted. I still, on, on occasion, I, I still struggle with this. But God does not want his people to be hard-hearted. So 
So I'd rather be emotional because the reflection of the reality of the, the beautiful work of God than to be stoic. But it's like, oh, that's a, that, was a, that, was a good, that was a good solid point about the love of God. Let me just mark that down. No, like, man, if it doesn't move you, what are we doing? Before Christ, we were hard-hearted. That is something that we do by choice, but also it just kind of happens in us. This is a result, resulting in, Paul says, what, what all of this does when we have darkened understanding, ignorance of God, and this, that results from alienation, and this hard-heartedness, he says, this is the result of it. We live shamelessly unfettered in, in uh, we have shameless, unfettered, and sinful desires. Look at the order of that. He does not say, you know, we have these shameless, unfettered, sinful desires, and that leads us to have darkened understanding and ignorance of God. He said, no, it works the other way around. It's because we don't know God. It's because we have darkened understandings. It's because we're cut off from the life that God wants to give us. It's because we are hard-hearted that we act this way. Now, I want you to think about your friends, family, and neighbor that don't know Jesus. And would you say that this might be true of some of them? Do you get upset for them, for that behavior, or do you say, of course they act that way, they don't know Jesus? What's the solution to that? The solution to that is we have to change the top for the bottom to get changed. We have to change our thinking and understanding our relationship with God and everything else, and then it trickles down into how we act. But we want to force it from the bottom up, and it doesn't work. This is how Paul continues. But this is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Did you hear that? He goes, I, I'm saying all about this like, don't act like the Gentiles. I guess, hold on a second, I'm assuming that you know Jesus. Because if you don't know Jesus, everything else I'm going to say here isn't going to make sense to you because you're still in that state. He says, because the truth is in Jesus. He says, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The change that God wants to bring in us starts on the inside. It's an internal makeover. It begins with learning Christ. And, I, and, and just so we're clear, not just learning about Jesus, but coming to know intimately Jesus Christ. And in that process, we learn how to be more like Jesus because we spend time with him and we get in his word and we see how he acts and through his spirit at work in us, we're like, I want to act like him. I have four kids. They're all up, uh, they're at a, a birthday party this weekend up uh, in the Crosby area. And I, and I say to my oldest all the time, hey, your, your, your brothers and sister are watching you you know, set a good example. You put a lot of pressure on the oldest kids. Sorry, oldest children. Kind of happens. All the oldest kids in here are like, thank you for saying it out loud. And the parents are like, yeah, 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 whatever. Uh, you need to go start the car right after the service. <clears throat> my, my youngest, my daughter, Raya, she's three, three and a half, and she does this thing, she's at that age where she sees her brother Ezra, who's like six and a half, do something, and she'll be like, try to do it just like him. Or she'll like copy Julie. It's hilarious. Like Julie will be sitting a certain way, my wife, and she'll like cross her legs or whatever, and then my daughter will cross her legs just like her. 
Or like she'll like, my wife will like push her hair behind her ear and my daughter will push her hair behind her ear. And she'll, it's very, very cute. But it reminds me that that is exactly what we're supposed to be doing with Jesus. He's our big brother and we're supposed to be like, I want to be like him. How do you know how to do that? I spend time with him. I get in his word. I learn his ways. And then I ask the same spirit that leads and guides Jesus to live inside of me and to lead and guide me. That's what it, why it begins with learning Christ. If we don't know Jesus, we can't act godly. If we don't know God, we can't act like we do. That's false. And we should not do it ourselves or encourage anyone else to. Do you know what happens when we fake godliness? That's the Nicodemus story. I don't need repentance. I'm fine. Why? Look at how I live. I'm, doing, I'm not doing all these things. I must be okay. Yeah, but that's not godliness. Godliness is acting like God. It's not just avoidance of certain behaviors. It's, it's actually living in the power of the Holy Spirit and, and doing the things that God commands us to do. You can't do that if you don't know God. So it begins with learning Christ. And this change continues with a desire to get rid of the old. How many of you, you can raise your hand if you want for this, how many of you have ever tried to, uh, to quit a bad habit? Anyone ever try to do that? All right. Those of you who did not raise your hand, you either have very weak willpower or you're lying. And that's fine. No, um, I didn't say that you quit the bad habit, just you tried to. Okay, so for instance, let's say dieting right? Like diet. You're like, I want to change. By the way, dieting is the worst word in the world to use to talk about weight loss. Because first of all, whatever you eat is your diet. If you eat McDonald's three meals a day, I have a diet. Are you on a diet? I am. What is it? Big Mac. That's, I'm on the Big Mac diet. It's a diet. Your diet's whatever you eat. But let's say you're saying, my diet is not healthy and I want to change my diet. You know what is a really good way to do that is to continually remind yourself of all the things you cannot have. That works very effectively. There should be more laughter because that never works. Okay? If you smoke and you're saying, I'm not going to smoke, I'm not going to smoke, I'm going to quit smoking, no more cigarettes, cigarettes are bad for me, I'm not going to smoke anymore, I'm done smoking, I'm done with smoking, no more cigarettes, no more cigarettes, I want a cigarette, where are my cigarettes? Right? Because you're still thinking about it. There are so many studies that find that if you want to get rid of a bad habit, there is only one good way to do it. You replace it with a good one. Only way. You want to have, get rid of bad eating habits? Replace them with good eating habits that don't feel like a sacrifice. That you're like, man, this is really good. Yeah, by the way, it's way healthier for you, but it tastes good, doesn't it? And then you suddenly don't miss the gross stuff that's killing you. Oh, okay. Or you're like, I'm trying to give up something that's bad for me. Well, take up something that's good for you. And that good for you doesn't have to be the same category. And I spend way too much time on my phone. Every time you want to pick up your phone, pick up your Bible. Replace it with something else. If we have a desire to get rid of the old in our life, God will recognize that. He will honor that. That starts by realizing that the old ways of thinking are based in lies. When we realize that our old way of thinking are based in lies, we will want to reject it. I'll also say there are times that we won't reject it anyway. Just be honest with yourself. There are times that you'll be like, listen, I know way back in my head that this is a lie, but I like it. so I'm going to keep doing it even though I know deep down that it's not, it's not based in truth, but it's comfortable. And sometimes the comfortable thing is actually something really bad for us and we know it's bad for us and it's hurting us and we still do it anyway because we are familiar with that pain. And we're scared sometimes of letting go of it for something else. Paul calls these deceitful desires. When we desire something, but it's something that we desire and it's, it's, it's a lie wrapped in a desire. I know you're stressed out. 
you know, if you just have some more chocolate cake, you will not feel so stressed. By the way, that is not true. You will still feel stressed. You'll feel worse about yourself after. You probably know that, but you're like, man, that cake was real good. And now you're wrapping the desire to have something that you probably don't need another piece of. I'm using food, sorry. That's my, that's my big vice. And you're wrapping it in a desire. And you might even wrap it in a desire like, well, I'm, just, I'm doing something good. I could have something much worse. I'm not out there smoking crack, so the cake's okay. I mean, like, you, nobody's ever justified bad choices, right? That's deceitful desires. But then this change really takes root in us as God renews our minds. Changes the way we think. Not just, it, it starts by saying, I acknowledge that these things are lies, but now I have to replace them with truth. And as God changes the basis for our life, we learn to think all over again. Elsewhere, Paul says it this way, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Be transformed. Be made into something new. The word transform, transform there in Greek is metamorphe. It's where we get the word metamorphosis from, as in the process by which, look on the front of your bulletin, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. How does that happen? First of all, not overnight. The renewal of our mind means that God changes our mind to make it something new. And I love the fact that God chose to use the word renewal. Do you know what renewal means here? It doesn't mean make my mind new again, but like, kind of like factory reset my mind. That's not what it means, right? Like if you've got like a phone or a computer and you're like, my phone is glitching out, I'm going to just set it back to factory defaults, right? Now it'll be back to kind of what it should be and then I can go from there. Problem with that is if we renew our mind to what it, should, what it was to start with, like from birth or something, it's still broken. Still running the bad operating system that caused all this to begin with. The word renewal means not only make new, but continually make new again and again and again. It's change my mind constantly into something that is new, that is different than it used to be. Not just refreshed, but something that is different than it was before. And it is talked about in a way, the, the word that is used here is actually a word that means in a reciprocal or a, a repeated process. It is not a one-time renew my mind. Your mind is renewed. You have a new mind. It's how does this transformation happen? God will constantly change your mind into something that it wasn't before and aligns with the mind of Christ. And Paul says here, when that happens, then we can discern God's will because we know him and we think more like him. Living differently begins with thinking in a new way. Christ in us transforms our thinking. And I, I can't stress this enough. Paul spent three chapters of this book, three chapters saying, I want you to see yourself differently than how you used to. I want you to think of yourself differently than you used to. If we don't start with a change in how we think and want to just jump to a change in how we act, that those changes will be superficial, they will not last, and they will lead to self-righteousness and more sin. But when we let God change how we think first, our actions follow. Christ in us transforms our thinking, which leads to transforming our desires, which then leads to transforming our actions. 
My family has gone this weekend. Um, my mother-in-law's 69th birthday is today. Yesterday was her sister's 70th birthday, an apparently surprise wedding that none of us knew about. And so my family, yeah, thing. Uh, you can talk to me about it later. Uh, they, they went up to Pequot Lakes, and, and up by, we have a cabin up by Crosby and stuff. Uh, you can pray for my mother-in-law, Alice. She fell and broke her rib uh, this weekend. Not good. So she's not doing great on her birthday. But they're up there, okay? They're gone. So this crazy thing happened this weekend that never happens. As of 10.30 yesterday morning, I have been a bachelor. And there are parts of me that are going, oh my goodness, I forgot what this feels like in the best possible ways. And there's parts of me that like, I kind of miss my family. But here's the thing. I can't not be a dad and a husband just because they're not there. So I, even though I, like I worked on homework all weekend, which is not like, normally I'm like, I got free time, I do whatever I want. I'm going to write a 25-page paper. Yay. I also did laundry. I also stripped people's bed and washed bedding, even though they're not even home. But I was like, I want them to come home and feel like I want them here. My desire is that my family feels loved. Boy, that's not who I am. That's, that's God in me. That's not me in me. What I want to do is sit around and play Tears of the Kingdom all weekend. I'm not doing that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are wearing his elder shirt today. But I'm not because as God changes the way we think, it changes our priorities and our desires, and that rolls out to our actions. And we cannot shortcut that process, people. We can't. When we try to shortcut the process of transformation in us, it becomes fake. And it doesn't last. And it actually can harm us and others in the process. And one of the most harmful things it can do is tell people, you don't need Jesus to be godly. You just have to fake it. And that's not introducing them to the Savior. That's introducing them to lying. One of the biggest things that non-Christians have against the church, what is the number one complaint that non-Christians have against Christians? We are hypocrites. We say one thing and do another. Hypocrisy comes when we shortcut this process. When we don't shortcut this process, we're not acting as hypocrites. We're being authentic, including in being honest about we're in this process and we screw up a lot. And not expecting other people who don't know Jesus to act like they do. But instead to meet them where they're at and help them begin this process too. So here's our so what. Change happens from the inside out. Are we letting God renew our minds? Renew how we think? Which leads to change actions. Are we doing that? Are we going through this process? Are we just trying to fake it and hope we make it? It doesn't work. Are we putting off the old and saying, God, I really want you to change me and start with how I think? I'm going to ask um, uh, Larry to come up um, as we, as we uh, have our time of prayer today. Are we letting Christ rule in us? And here's our meditation verse for today. 